This is Support is Sexy, episode 569, with Kristen Lay, founder and owner of Thimble Press. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I bring you inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and lessons to help you take your business to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so happy to have you here. You know, it just would not be the same without you. And listen, if you are at the stage in your business, your career, your life, where you're ready to take it to the next level, you know you have more to offer, you know you have more things that you want to do, and you want to level up, I want you to be sure to download my free meditation on leveling up your mindset. Your mindset plays a crucial role in the way you manage not only your success, but also how you get through those failures. It all comes down to mindset. And in this free meditation, I help you get get grounded, get centered. It's a meditation you can use daily or whenever you want to listen to level up your mindset. And you can download that meditation for free at levelupmindset.coach. That's levelupmindset.coach. And while you're there, make sure you find out more information about an eight-week course that I have where you and I will work together to level up your mindset in all kinds of ways. I'm telling you, it's so important. It's been crucial to my success and again, helping me get through the low points in my business and surviving and figuring things out and keeping it moving. Levelupmindset.coach. Now today I'm super excited to welcome our guest. If you're a maker, you're going to be excited to hear about this, especially if you're into the crafts and that kind of industry. This is our guest today, Kristen Lay from Thimble Press. And Kristen talks to us about a lot of things of being a maker, but also taking the time to get to know your customer, the benefit of retail shows for makers, three things that you want to have in place if you want to sell your products wholesale. We talk a lot about wholesale in this episode. Kristen also talks about trade shows, the importance of trade shows and how to do your best at trade shows, what you need to do your best at trade shows. She gives some great tips for those in the crafts industry, like certain kinds of platforms that you want to be on, certain shows that you may want to go to. And just so you know, Kristen has a little bit of experience with this because Thimble Press is sold in over 1,500 stores across the United States. So she has the experience here. She's giving us the inside scoop on paper products, journals, and all those ways that you can make and create products and sell them in different ways. And Kristen also consults and helps mentor other makers. So all that good stuff is wrapped up in here. If you're a maker, again, you're going to want to listen to this episode. So without further ado, Kristen Lay. So Kristen, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to chat with you. I know. I'm so excited. When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Honestly, I think my subconscious fell (laughs) fell in love with it before I realized I was in love with it. Both my grandfathers owned their own small businesses in Texas. They had pharmacies and where they sold products and um, they helped people and they created their own life and their own hours. And I used to go to trade shows with them. And I think I was always in love with it, but I don't think it hit me until I was leaving college and had... I could go off one direction into corporate America and work for a really amazing design firm, or I could just be nuts and go and work and start my own company. And so that's what I did. <laughs> that's what you did. Now, where did you grow up again? I grew up um, in Texas and in Mississippi. In Texas and Mississippi. Could you? I read somewhere where you said born in, born in Texas, raised in Mississippi, or was it the reverse? Yes, yes. Yes, that's correct. Yes, that's correct. How do you think being from Texas and Mississippi, um, which are such states with such pride, I think, from people I know there, how do you think that affects um, who you are as a person today? Oh, gosh. Well, I I mean, I really think family is really important, at least in Texas and in Mississippi, too. But, you know, my whole family is originally from Texas. But, you know, both the states, I think family values and like, 
those core values of who you are um, are really important, at least in my family, they are. And also in Mississippi, just a sense of community. I'm based in downtown Jackson, Mm -hmm. um, which there's not a ton going on here, but it's growing. And just the support um, of the community has been invaluable for me. And so I know that has given me confidence in what I do every day. Is that still where you're based now or where you currently are? It at? is. I am still in Mississippi, yes. I love it. That's excellent. I have a yeah. lot of family from different parts of Mississippi. Oh, so awesome. Well, if, you, if you come by Jackson, come visit. <laughs> come visit. Excellent. So who would you say were some of your greatest influences growing up? Um, definitely my grandmothers. Both of them were very crafty. Um, both of them taught me how to sew. So hence, you know, the name Thimble. In the, in thimble press kind of plays into that. I also collected thimbles as a child. My mother started that collection for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but they just played a huge part in cultivating and encouraging my creativity and letting me paint and draw and exposing me to different ways to create. My dad's mom, she made everything. I mean, even the the like the wooden lawn art you know that you see at Christmas she right. would make her own like <laughs> grandma get, got her chainsaw out you know mm-hmm. and, got to <laughs> and then my my mom's mom made all their clothing like she sewed all of their clothes from you know every part of their life and so getting to be experience that and getting to learn from both of them and it's really cool I have both of their tables in my home so they just were a really important part of of really, like I was saying, instilling that confidence and showing me that I can do things beyond just, you know, learning things in school. And I don't mean to say school is important. Yes, it is. But, you know, especially in schools today, we aren't taught skills like that. And we aren't maybe shown how important the arts are. And so they really told me it was great and awesome and that I could do things with it. And I think it allowed me to expand my worldview a little bit. But as I was saying, I have both their tables in my kitchen and my dining room. And I just, they, they've been such a huge part of my life. And unfortunately, I lost both of them mm. before I was 18. Um, so that was really sad. But they, I still feel like they're with me. Um, and they play a huge role. And then you know, the teachers, the art teachers I had, my mom, my parents, just the encouragement they always gave me. They never said I had to be something. They just let me decide. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't the best artist in the room by any means, but they always thought I was the best artist. Right. You know, they Made just, you feel they, like the best artist. Yeah, and I think, and so I think a huge part of that really influences who I am today in terms of like why encouragement is so important to me and why I like try to, get the point across that you should encourage others because it really does. And it can change someone's life, just believing in them and like telling them that they're doing great and just reinforcing positive, you know, reinforcement in their life. I think it's such a huge, a huge deal breaker and life changer moment for some people. Um, and it can shape who they become. So from what I read, you were very attracted to the, the arts since childhood. And you just mentioned one of the main reasons, obviously, your grandmothers were very influential. But what do you think really drew you to art? What did you always love about it? I loved that I could escape into something, that I could make something truly my own and with my hands. And I think I've always just loved that, that sense of completion and instant gratification. I can sit down with a paint or a pen or a, you know, whatever and collage and make something that wasn't there before. Um, I mean, that desire, I feel like is, it goes back, you know, ancient times, like people have been creating forever. And so, and I think they do it because there's this, this sense of joy you get when you bring something new into the world that, hasn't ever existed and so I think that is just really awesome and it's it's kind of my little way of therapy like people think it's so crazy that I still art is my hobby like painting and creating is still my hobby and it's still my passion even though that's what I do for my job I mean 
which we can talk about that further. You know, the, <laughs> the everyone's like, oh, you get to paint all day. And I'm like, well, it's like, you know, now <laughs> when I first started, it was like 90% creating, 10% running a business. Now it's, it's sort of shifted, right? <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. of course. And, um, but I do, it, it really is, it's very therapeutic for me. And it's just, and it's my own little thing that, that no one else has. And so I think that's just what's, so nice about it. I wonder why people think, as you said, that um, it's sort of still a part of, you still can't enjoy it the way you used to, maybe when it was just a hobby or a passion or when they at least thought that's what it was. I when, think, and the fact that you're in yeah. your business. I know I feel yeah. like that about writing. I love it no matter what, but it is also a part of my business and my work. Yeah, and I think people, um, they say that because I think it is wild for a lot of people to grasp the idea that you would want to do what you do every day for work as your hobby. Mm -hmm. And I, because that is such a foreign thing to a lot of people, you know, a lot of people punch a clock and there's no passion associated with what they do. And I've always been about do what makes you happy. And my parents always infuse that in me. And so the idea of not doing something that brought me joy for my job, quote unquote, you know, that is very foreign, but I think the majority of the world, you know, thinks that way, you know, it's, it's in terms of they're not, they don't understand that it can be both kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So when you were younger, obviously you were very much into art and design, but did you know that you would, did you have a feeling that you could quote unquote become an artist? Was that part of your reality well, because of the encouragement from your family? Right. So I think, you know, (laughs) I started, you know, my mom signed me up. She was amazing. She signed me up for this enrichment class at a college one summer because I just, I expressed interest in drawing and, you know, I wasn't really great at sports. I participated in them. I never really shined at them. So I never really had a confidence in that. And I wasn't, I was smart. I graduated with honors, but I was never, you know, super smart. One of the super smart kids. Um, I, you know, But I loved, I think my my mom just saw how I lit up when I made things and painted and created. And so she signed me up for this college enrichment class and it, or this enrichment community enrichment class at a college. And it was all these elderly people and me, (laughs) (laughs) ninth, ninth grade, you know, but it was so amazing because I had never, ever painted on a real canvas before with real paints like cadmium red and you know, yellow ochre. And I just, that moment was such a just light bulb for me because it had always just been like art classes and, you know, at school or um, making things just as I did on, you know, at my house. And so it made me feel important. And it, I kind of ran with that and I loved it. And I became good at it in terms of I, I put hard work into it because I loved it. I don't think I was the best by any means, but I, so I saw that and I saw, huh, I really enjoy this. I can kind of be good at it. I've won some like scholastic little awards, you know, in my local, you know, school. I wonder if like what career I could do, <laughs> this is where my brain went. I've always been very driven what career could I do where I could do art and make money? <laughs> mm-hmm. This is what you were thinking in high school. Oh, after this is that class. Total, yes. This is, mm-hmm. I mean, most high schoolers do not think this way. Mm-hmm. Of course, this is the way I've, I always have thought, and it is due to a lot of personal things that have gone on in my life. But I thought, how can I make money and create art? I don't want to be a quote unquote starving artist. And so, um, someone said, you do graphic design. <laughs> And I said, great, um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, and I'm a very driven, just determined person. I'm going to do graphic design and I'm going to do it well. I had no clue what graphic design was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I went to, to college, signed up for the program, you know, went through the application process to get into the program, went to Mississippi State. It was very competitive to get in. I got in, thrilled, and I worked my tush off in that program to be the best in my class. Now they didn't give an award saying you're the best in the class by any means, but I really, I, I applied and I just started putting myself out there. I applied for, um, 
all the competitions I could sign up for, I signed up for, you know, and it's so tricky because, you know, it costs money to sign up for those. And it's so subjective, but I started winning competitions, which Mm. continued to instill confidence in me. And so I continued to keep pushing and pushing myself, which I still do today, but pushing and pushing myself to just excel in the graphic design field. And by the time I graduated, I had won a national gold ad ward, Addy, um, which is the Advertising Federation, which if you're in that world, it's a big deal. And I got to go to the whole award ceremony. It, it was in Kentucky that year. And I felt it was kind of like I've, I, I've gotten to the top moments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, of course, I'm like dumb and still in college and don't even know what the real world is. And I'm like, I've done it. <laughs> in that moment, you felt like you were on top of the world, though. Oh, on top of the world. And then I also like applied for internships, but I couldn't just accept any internship. So I went through like print magazine, which at the time, and I'm sure it still is. I'm just not as heavily involved in the graphic design world as I was. Print magazine was like the epitome of like design magazines. And they had an awards, um, an award, regional award thing every year where every, every year they publish the top like studios and firms across the country. Well, I knew I could stay with my aunt in Dallas because that's where she lived and she was going to let me stay there for free. So I said, I'm going to apply to only people that have made it into print magazine as for my internship. That's Mm -hmm. all I will accept (laughs) is print magazine working for someone that made it into print mag. So I, I created this elaborate, you know, almost like press kit. If you want to think about it today, promo, not at an email because email is not personal and mailed in this elaborate promo piece into all these firms that were listed. And I got one, um, the matchbox studio in, in Dallas, Texas, and they're an incredible, incredible team. Um, I love the owner, Liz Burnett. Um, they're just so great, but I, Again, it was like a, oh, I did it kind of like life moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was kind of my, my start into the art and graphic design, design world, as you want to call it. And it was me just striving and going after what I wanted. And I think that really set me up for where I am today. I really do. Now, one of the things that you mentioned uh, a couple of times in telling us your story or your journey um, was that for personal reasons or for some other reasons, you're very driven or, you know, you strive for the success or to be number one. Is there something that um, inspired you or moved you in some way growing up or in your childhood that made you feel like it was important to strive to be number one or you had to be number one or what was the, well, it was not I too will, personal, obviously, but. Right. And it is a little personal. Um but I never wanted to rely on anyone else to provide for me. I'll just put it at that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be able to provide for myself. And that even as early as high school, that's like, that was, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Always. And and I think that what is what kind of has always driven my desire because I'm not a competitive person like board games. I just am like, let's just play to have fun and like laugh at each other. I've never cared about winning, but like put me into this, to the graphic design world. I was like, I want to win the Super Bowl of graphic design Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I knew it would fuel my future career. And it was more, it was, it wasn't about just me. It was about my future me. And that sounds really crazy, but you know, I think we all go through things in life that, subconsciously fuel our desire to succeed or whatever we do, the decisions we make. And, and that was one of them, which it has also hurt me. You know, it is <laughs> that desire to succeed. I haven't taken, maybe always taken care of the best, you know, of myself, the best and overlooked specific areas that I probably needed to focus on. Cause I was so like focused in on, on achieving and that mm-hmm. is changing over time. I'm growing and learning and realizing some things about myself, but you know, for a long time, that is what fueled my just desire to keep going and was to always be able to take care of myself. 
Then at what point did you, so the position that you got at Matchbox Studio, that was an internship or a full-time position? That was an internship. Okay. And then did you go into the industry after that? I, so after that, so that internship was when I was in college and I afterwards went back and completed my senior year. And then I went and moved to Charleston, South Carolina and started a design firm with a friend We did graphic design and marketing and branding for clients. And it was so fun. And we did that for about five years. Mm. Yeah. So that was crazy, fun experience. I'd never been to Charleston, South Carolina in my life. New, like talk about like the backwards way of starting a business. One in probably the worst time in economic history since the the 80s kind of recession. Um, It was, this was 2007. Oh, right. Um, At the time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But also moving to a location where I didn't know a soul as in no connections, but I also, I was going through some personal things and, and no one knew me in Charleston. No one knew like any, my family or like any connections I could have. And I think I was, I think my subconscious was like, I'm determined to, again, to do this on my own with no one else's like support or, or name, or it's, it's all me and then my business partner. And I I think that was my subconscious thought, you know, I think now, you know, years later, I realized that, but also it was just Charleston's a fun place. Charleston, you're on the beach. It is a fun, fun city. And I was in my early twenties and, you know, I, I knew, I was stupid, but I also, we were smart. We were good at what we did. And I think the most frustrating thing about that, starting a business at 22, was no one took me seriously. No one took us seriously, even though we really were good at what we did. Um, But we ended up getting a lot of great clients and a lot of amazing opportunities. And we worked our butts off to network and be in the community. By the time I ended up moving from Charleston, I felt like I knew everyone in that city. And that is a testament to really hustling and getting your name out there. And And not letting the fact that people either don't take you seriously or think I would imagine you're saying because they thought you were so young and you know, who are you with this business, et cetera, not letting that be the thing that stops you. Yeah, totally. And I think in the back of my head, I was like, well, I'm I'll just prove all of them wrong. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we did. And we did. And it was fun. And, and, you know, we made mistakes, but we also had lots of great successes and lots of lessons learned. And um, I ended up moving back to Jackson, Mississippi, where I'm currently at in 2010 or 11. I can't remember now. And I kept a business, I kept half of the business, um, For about a year, we kept doing it, different time zones, the business. And then she ended up getting offered a full-time job. And then I ended up getting offered a full-time job. And honestly, I was tired. And I was also just really trying to figure out if that was what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I got, And it wasn't that I was tired of the design. I got tired of the client management of the client. I, I got tired of constantly trying to explain that I was good at what I did and they should trust me. And I think a lot of it was because we were young and we did have to kind of circumvent that. But I got tired of having to like explain like why we were good, all the awards we had won, like kind of thing. And so I took the full-time job. She took the full-time job and we just said, Hey, if we ever live in the same city again, let's do something together because she's like the Phoebe to my Monica. Like we are, we work (laughs) so We worked so well together. She's one of my dearest friends. And like we lived and we worked and we played together and we got along and we never had a falling out. And I mean, that's a huge testament to like, we're very, we're very opposite, (laughs) but also just, she's one of the few people I think I could own a business with again. Um, But yeah, so I ended up getting a full-time job, but then during that full-time job is when I started Thimble press as a, as, ins- a, as a hobby. <laughs> as a hobby. I was going to say, so what inspired then Thimble Press, which is your company now? Yeah. So I, you know, was doing a lot of design on my computer, a lot of, you know, graphic stuff, you know, a lot of, a lot of work for clients. That idea of I was constantly doing things for other people. And I think I was missing that I want to create for myself 
to create, to create, not to create for an end, you know, goal in mind. And I think that in that moment, that feeling, that desire to just make, um, was what started Thimble Press. I just had, I wanted to make things with my hands again. I wanted to get back to that childlike feeling I had when I was young that, you know, initially fueled my desire to be an artist. I wanted that feeling again because I just felt like I'd kind of lost it through just doing design and branding and marketing and strategies and, you know, planning and all that for people. And so I, after lots of prayers, found a letterpress on briarpress.org. It's a great letter letterpress community. Um, and back then, people weren't buying letterpresses like they are now. What's it called but again? A it letterpress. A, it's a, it's a, the one I ended up purchasing is about 900 pounds of steel. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have three now. Um, but the one I bought in... Kentucky, I will never get rid of. It is a Chandler and Price. It's from 1925. So in a few years, it will be a hundred years old. Wow. It is a beautiful piece of machinery. Um, you know, and up until the 1950s, letterpress was the height of printing technology. You know, it was before like the photocopy came um into the into you know modern technology and all that. And it that's what was used to print the written word. Mm-hmm. And I think to me, 1950 wasn't that long ago considering the history of our world. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's an instant gratification type of thing. You can create or use old type from years ago that was used to be part of history, part of posters. You don't know what it was used for, which is good and bad, but it's really cool to think about all the different little ad cuts and you can put them on, on the press, load them in, and, and put your ink on and print something. And then there it is. It's not an Epson printer where if a dog hair, cat hair gets in it, the whole right. thing out and won't print. Right. <laughs> it's, it is, you can print almost on at least the Chandler and Price. You can print on bags, you can print on textile. And it's just, you know, to a certain degree, you know, of large, you know, size, but it is just, it's magical. And I, so I started printing. I bought the press. I borrowed a, my dad's truck and learned how to haul a trailer and brought the trailer back to Mississippi. I convinced a friend to ride with me. And and when you were doing and, this, was it still a hobby at this point? Oh, or yeah. I mean, for, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For about a year, it sat. The press sat in six months in my dad's garage, six months in my mom's garage, two months in my garage that I eventually moved into. I was terrified to use it. Don't think it was like this instant love fest where I just knew how to do it. It no. sounds like it was intimidating kind of, right? Oh my gosh. It was a nine, it's a 900 pound piece of machinery. Mm-hmm. It was, it's, I mean, it looks super intimidating. So I ended up calling a mentor over at Edmund and he taught me how to use the press and I had learned and, and really, um, and really kind of gone over things and, figured it out, but he having him there in person was what kind of changed it for me because it just kind of, Oh, all these pictures you've been staring at of a press and diagrams. Well, here, this is how you do it. It just kind of gave me a sense of, I can do this. I can accomplish this. And so once I started printing on it, I mean, I remember having an open house um, with my friend. She's also a maker. uh, She's living in Nashville. Now she's little thing studio but we lived together. And so we had like this Christmas open house and she said, you, <laughs> you should do a, a press demonstration. And I had, ne- I had yet to like really run the press, like really run it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, I've got this. <laughs> and I think back now it was terrible. And of course the people watching had no idea that this was happening, but like looking back, I'm like, I put too much ink on the press. I was it was way over inks. Like it sounded awful. Like it printed awful, but you know, to all of them, they're like, Whoa, (laughs) but you know, learning lessons, but yeah, I think after, so I had the press kind of running for about a couple months and I had been creating products, um, like drawings off of the letter press for about six months. And again, this is all while I had a new full-time job. I would just come home every day after work and draw and paint and, and create. And then 
have an intention to want to go letter press it, but was too scared. <laughs> now, when you letter press it, for, for me and anyone who doesn't understand, are you making, is it like you're making cards out of it or stationary or just seeing it yeah, on paper so or you're putting it on? Yeah, so greeting cards, art prints. Okay, um, and you're printing it yourself as opposed to sending it off to someone to print it yes, for Yes, yes. And it's also, you know, letter press, it's when the, it's kind of, Screen printing is when you pull ink through a screen. If you picture a letterpress, it's like a giant, and I'm sure letterpress people listening will cringe when I say this, but it's like a giant stamp, <laughs> essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, so the press I have is a, it's a clamshell press. And so ink rollers will roll over the image that I'm going to be printing. And then it will, I'll put paper into the one area and it will close on itself and print on top of that paper into the paper, press into the paper essentially. So that's what's called a letter press because it's literally pressing the image or the ink into the paper. And so a lot of times you'll get an indention into the paper, um, which a lot of people love now traditionally. And um, it's not supposed to have an indention, but people love to feel that indention in the paper. Um, I'm sure you have felt it um, or held a wedding invitation or something mm-hmm. that has been letter pressed. Um, it's a be- beautiful tactile quality that it gives. Um, but I, yeah, I started creating products on it and my friend convinced me to start an Etsy shop. And of course I was like, what's Etsy? Um, <laughs> and she sweetly explained it to me mm-hmm. and that's kind of where Thimble Press began. And in your Etsy shop, were you, um, were you offering the printing services or were you printing the, the products and things that you were creating and then posting them on Etsy for people to obviously purchase them? Right. So I was, pr- and I think I was so s- scarred by the service, like industry <laughs> and dealing with clients. I was like, I can't do any custom <laughs> right now. You can't now. do any, what's that? <laughs> any custom work. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So you were saying so, these are my products that I create. Yes, exactly. I would create products, photograph them, you know, and then put them on my Etsy shop. And it was kind of, it was the, I started it, I think the year Instagram came out, maybe 2012. So, but no one was really on Instagram, but I started an Instagram. Um, I've always seen the value in social media with, in terms of marketing and how I would use it for clients in the past. And so I started putting, you know, products onto Instagram. I had yet to start wholesale yet, but I remember, and I actually was just talking with her the other day, um, this retailer, I remember I posted, I did a, and I still have it, our state flower collection, which is all the state flowers blooming inside the shape of the state. Hmm. And I had created the Tennessee one. I did hashtag Tennessee. And of course you can't do this now. It would be like crazy to, you know, people were barely using, using hashtags and she found me and placed an order with me based off that hashtag. Don't we wish hashtags still were used that way. Um, And this was on Instagram. Yes. I Mm -hmm. know. Isn't that funny? She was my first Tennessee retailer because of that. And it was really cool to see Thimble Press grow and then eventually deciding to take the leap into wholesale Mm -hmm. was, I think, the biggest game changer for Thimble Press. So how did you know then when to take that leap? Because as you said, you started it as a hobby, a very, uh, you invested a lot, it sounds like time, energy, I'm sure some money as a hobby. But then at what point did you know, okay, I think this can be a business that I'm going to dedicate my time to? Right. So I mean, I still had my full time job, but I would go to craft shows on the weekends. And my sweet, the sweet place where I worked, which was the school I had attended in high school, they just, I I think it was by the grace of God that I was able to take the time I did to do these shows. I mean, I would drive to Nashville. I was driving to South Carolina. I was driving anywhere, Chicago. I went to Chicago one weekend. Um, and I was hustle. I mean, I don't know how it's truly only by God that I had that energy that, or it was because I was in my twenties. Um, (laughs) combination. um, Yeah. Combination. But I was nonstop and I would go to these craft shows and I was approached at Renegade Craft Show in Chicago, September 2012 by a woman. And she walked up to me. She was so sweet. And she said, have you ever thought about doing wholesale? And I looked at her and I said, well, and, I, and I'm just a very honest person. And I said, 
I know you're going to think this is so funny, but what is wholesale? And most people I'm sure, you know, now in the world, because edu- education of doing this type of thing is so, there's so much more info, info about it out there. But, you know, most people in the world don't think about how products get into stores that they love to shop at. Mm -hmm. And so, but that is what wholesale is. Wholesale is selling your products to other retailers so they can then sell it in their stores um, online or brick and mortar. And and I, right, right. Mm -hmm. And so she explained to me what wholesale was and I was like, okay, interesting. And she said, well, I'm the, you know, I am the founder of the, or director of the emerging artist area at the Chicago gift market, which RIP, I miss the Chicago gift market. It's no longer in existence, but, um, or the Chicago gift fair, the one I did, but she said, it's only, you know, $300 for a three by five emerging artist booth. We're offering, you know, brands or artists a really great deal on it and it's in January, which Chicago in January, I didn't even think about it when I, mm. <laughs> I'd never been to Chicago. I didn't know how brutal the winters were. Um, she said it's a three by five. So I really kind of thought about it and I just prayed about it and I just felt God kind of putting it on my heart. And cause the craziest thing was the people I had rented my Airbnb from for the Chicago renegade that I was at, the time they ended up having to stay and that was fine. They, have, they had plenty of room, but I became friends with them and talk about a cool, like full circle moment. The girl whose Airbnb I rented, her and a friend owned a company together that did installation design and they ended up designing my booth at the Chicago gift market. Mm, and nice. it's just, I know so cool how all that worked out and um, it went from, I got a call about a month before saying, hey, the South African consulate has backed out of their space, their floor at the Chicago gift market. And I was like, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> she said, we're upgrading all of the emerging artists from a three by five space to a 10 by 12 space for free. That's a huge upgrade though. Are you thinking I at this know. point, how do I fill this space? No, I was thinking, oh my gosh, God is so awesome and good. <laughs> like, that is incredible. Like, in like that is one of those like fate, faith, God moments that is just what? Like triple the size, basically. Triple for free. I mean, it made me look like I had my stuff together for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then you had the people who helped you design it. So it and wasn't you like know what's even it. crazier? I won best booth design. Really nice. Yeah, of course you did. It was a very kismet show. Like Mm -hmm. I ended up meeting Paper Source there. I met one of the rep groups that I then worked with for three years there. Uh, Or how many years? 13, 14, 15, 16, five years there. Um I it I ended up meeting my art rep that I worked that I just signed with this past year, who have been friends with since that show. Um So do you highly recommend these um, shows then for people, anyone who's listening who has products or something like, you know, crafts that they could show at these kinds of uh, shows, certainly having it on Etsy or places out there at their own shop. It's kind of a two prong approach. So there's the retail side, which I think it is so invaluable to start to sign up to go to craft shows or retail shows because you're face to face with your consumer. I think knowing your customer is so important. Like knowing your target market is so important. Like knowing that before you even start all this is taking the time to do that. So you know who you're speaking to, who you're selling to the products you're creating for is so crucial. But then going to these retail shows, you know, you'll earn a, you'll earn a pretty good, pretty penny, Sometimes the shows you won't make as much as you maybe wanted to, but I bring postcards to every show. You're getting your name out there. You're getting FaceTime. You're getting FaceTime with people, with customers. That is invaluable. They're going to remember your company. They're going to take a postcard. They're going to take it home. Every time I did a retail show, like Renegade Craft, Porter Flea, um, Christmas shows, I would always get orders on my Etsy or my website or actually Etsy because I didn't even have a website till after I attended my second trade show. We can talk about that. Crazy. Um, 
I would get orders on my Etsy from those exact locations. So I knew it was working beyond just the show. It's great for marketing. That, but that FaceTime really is invaluable. Uh, and then if you're wanting to do wholesale and you're thinking wholesale would be a great, op- great option to grow your brand and you have the right product you know, pricing in place and the margins in place because you, you want to be able to make money on the products you're selling wholesale, you know, these shows are a great option. I think a lot is changing. I think the shows aren't necessarily as popular as they were like the big ones, but I still think they're very valid and valuable. I think you have, again, it's about the FaceTime. You have the FaceTime with the customers. You have the FaceTime with the reps. You have the FaceTime with press, you know, especially the, the shows in bigger cities, wholesale shows, you know, you're getting press that's located there. So magazines, newspapers, you know, <clears throat> news, um, all that. They're there, bloggers. They're there to like get the scoop on what's new, write about it because they're looking for content for their businesses as well. So it, it really is a great opportunity. And a lot of the things that I love is that, you know, people say, well, I want to make this much money at a show. But what I was saying just five minutes ago, a lot of it comes after the fact. It could come six months from then. It could come a year from the show. You just never know. And that's why I follow up with people that, you know, grab a catalog or people that come, you know, into your booth, getting their email addresses, staying in touch with them, you know, that's why that is all so important. And it's also a big part of the pie. Mm-hmm. And now um, Thimble Press or your products are sold in over 1500 stores in the U.S. Is that right? Did I read that right? Yes. yes. Okay. So what would you say then, having gone through this whole experience, um, what would you say are three tips that women entrepreneurs listening who may have products that they want to get in boutiques or stores, what are some things that they must have in place? Well, you, you want to have a wholesale line and your pricing. That's super important. You, you've obviously made the decision to want a wholesale. So knowing what your margin is um, with the market we have right now, Keystone, which is 50% of your um, re- suggested retail price is typically what you offer wholesale. Um, having a way that people can you know, place orders with you. Um, a catalog is a great um, asset to have. With a physical SKUs. catalog or online? Well, both. Um, like we have, we didn't print a catalog this year. We just have a digital one. But the mm-hmm. first four years of doing wholesale, we always had a printed catalog. I think it's great to send a printed catalog in the mail with some samples of your product to the top retail stores that you would like to be in. I think. Also, like that whole like sending kits out, sending mail out, like spending money on reaching out to the people you want to work with, being intentional about it and not just sending an email is so important. Um, And then just having a good attitude to listen and take feedback and grow, I think is also a big part of it. Um, My line has changed dramatically in the almost eight years that I've done this. I mean, I've gone from kind of more rustic vibes to really like finding my niche and who I am. And we're definitely really colorful and vibrant and, you know, modern and fun. And that all is reflected back into the core values of who I am. And so I I think another tip is before you move any further with, with adding things onto your business, just making sure you have those core values in place and knowing who your customer is, is so important I think in any part of a business, not just wholesale. Um, and then making sure you have, you know, SKUs for all your different prices. I mean, products, giving them, which a SKU is like a, it's a, like a little code instead of the card name, like happily ever after greeting card. It's, you know, HPS004. It's just an easier way to identify a product, especially for retailers. Mm-hmm. And I think, There's also great options for education, just understanding the trade show world a little more in depth. My friend has a runs a company called Trade Show Boot Camp, and it's oh my gosh, I interviewed her. Oh, Katie! Yay, Yay. Katie! Yes, I was going to excellent. That's great. I'll for everyone listening. I'll I'll make sure I link to her episode too. Yeah, she's awesome. She's in my mastermind group too. But awesome. she offers a really great program. If you're wanting to go into wholesale, like 
I, I did it. I went through the program. It's called, um, I did the trade show like webinar series mm-hmm. and I didn't do the in, in person one, but I mean, that one's probably even more invaluable. And it honestly like set me up for success in, in terms of it got me ready for all the things I needed to know to go into a trade show. Like, I mean, there's so many details about building a booth and like fireproofing your fabrics. I mean, it's crazy. Like getting your shipments to New York, to the Java Center, it's wild, but you can do it. And I think also just taking it one step at a time and just breathing and realizing it all doesn't have to happen at once because <laughs> right. it is a lot. And you probably don't want it all to happen at once, right? Right, exactly. And I noticed also that you've decided now, speaking of Katie and her boot camp, you've decided also to start teaching other creatives through your own mentoring and weekend workshops. So why yeah. was, why was yeah, this something important for you to do at this point? You had your business now, how many, eight years, did you say? It'll be eight years in January. And okay. I just... Honestly, I've always had a heart for seeing others succeed and helping others. I'm an Enneagram too. If you're familiar with the Enneagram, then you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not, then you're probably like, what did she just say? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I'm, it's the helper. I'm Mm -hmm. very, I love helping others. And I do that in a way through our products with encouraging, I I give people tools to help others (laughs) and celebrate others, which is such a important part of my life. But I think I had a piece of it missing that was really having great one-on-one time with people. And I know what I've been through in life. Like God didn't have me go through all the things I've been through to, to keep it to myself. And so having an outlet for me to share it. And I just, I would get emails and calls. Hey, can we chat? Hey, can you like mentor me? And it just kept building and building and building. And I needed, for me, I needed to have like a, a place where I could funnel all of that. And so that's when I created Kristenlay.com. And I've actually like already had, I just started it, but I've already had a weekend workshop and it was fantastic. And the amount of like work you can get done like face to face and one-on-one is incredible. And I just, it, it really can benefit others to share what you've been through and, and what you know, because if I would have had, which oh, I can't even imagine what it would be like if I had the education, like opportunities that are out there now, mm-hmm. back when I started, or like if I knew what I know now back then, I mean, which is, it's all part of our journey and our story, but oh my gosh, I would have saved so much time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and how many people are in your company now? There are five of us. We're very small. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like it that way. I'm not, I, I think I used to want to just manage this massive company with tons of people because I think that's the world that the world says success is, is being this big CEO boss. And I just, I finally kind of this past year, like did a lot of like soul searching and realized like, I don't want a massive company. I want to do big, big old things, but I want to be a small lean team right. and and be more intentional with our decisions and be really like mindful of how we're moving forward and just not just I think we grew really fast and I was almost I felt like I was almost in autopilot because we were just constantly growing and moving and I just was like going through the motions and I finally just had to really just shake things up and and understand like whoa, hold on. Like I can't keep reacting. I need to be, you know, seeking out and choosing. Mm -hmm. And so that has been a huge shift in my life, which is also what propelled me to create Mm kristenlay.com. And now you, um, you're not working, you're you're focused on this full time, obviously. Now you're not doing your other, other job that you had before you let that go. And you're fully focused on your business. On Thimble Press and Kristenlay.com, yes. Yeah. So I my full time job. I did Thimble Press for a year and a half until I left. So, which was actually a really long time considering all I was doing. I mean, I went to the National Stationery Show while I had a full time job. I went mm-hmm. to the. It was bonkers, but I did it. And again, I went by myself, which I still am like God somehow gave me like the strength of a giant to do all of that because. I look back now and I'm like, I could never do that now. (laughs) I would pass out. 
Um, I think I just was like, had this crazy drive that was almost unstoppable. And now I'm like, I need sleep. <laughs> right. Yeah, different. Exactly. And then that drive in the beginning too, you're sort of fueled by, you know, just the passion and the newness of it and discovery and all those and things. I, and I still have that drive, but the drive I had then was almost like. And you were in your 20s. And I was in my 20s. It wasn't right. real. It wasn't right. real. Like, <laughs> it wasn't I, real. I think I look back now and I'm like, how did I do that? Because I had the same drive I had back then. But it is just the end, like the strength. It must be my 20s. We're just going to put it on that. (laughs) What would you say is the biggest challenge in your business today? And how are you and your team sort of facing it? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is it's not necessarily a challenge, but it's making sure that we're mindful and taking time to evaluate all opportunities that present itself instead of just saying yes and going at it instead of like taking on everything, um, which is also a personal struggle or not even struggle, personal just thing I'm working on. And like, even if it's something that like I was asked recently to be honored, you know, at some at two different things in my city or speak on a panel. And I just, I was like, I I'm going to have to pass because it just, it, I would have expended myself beyond my, just my own self. Like it would have been way too much energy directed. And, and I just, and so I think it's for me taking on things that make sense at the time. And, and that, really go towards my North star and my dreams and my goals um, and reaching out and giving back in ways that are best for this company and my community. So if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be? And what would you say? Oh, my mom. My mom, for sure. Um, She has taught me faith. She's taught me the importance of being patient and waiting. She's taught me, she's spoken a lot of truth when I didn't want to hear it into my ear. She's been the most honest with me. She's backed me up when I needed it. She has been there through thick and thin and I wouldn't be the woman I am today or, and I wouldn't have the business I have without her. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kristen. Tell us now how we can support you. Anything you want us to, any websites you want us to go to? Of course, I'll have links yeah, and all so, these great resources you gave us too. Yeah. So thimblepress.com is my brand. And then kristenlay.com is my coaching and my mentoring and my, kind of business outreach type of website. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you again. And thank you for sharing your, you know, a little bit of your, about yourself personally, your drive and, and what drove you to have your drive and all those yeah. things growing up. I Absolutely. Appreciate yeah. Now, before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? Oh gosh. I would say, listen to your gut slow down enough so you can like really process things so that you don't ever get so busy that you're moving in autopilot. Just slow down and like listen and take time to make decisions that are best for you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Kristen. To find out more about her, to find out more about Thimble Press, to find out more about her mentoring and how she's helping makers, make sure you go to supportissexy.com. Go to that search box and just type Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N. Her show notes page will pop up with the links, the resources, and all the ways, again, to find out more about her and to get a 30% discount on Thimble Press products. Thank you for that, Kristen. Again, go to supportissexy.com and just search Kristen. Thank you so much for being here. You know I appreciate you. Until we chat again, I want you to always remember support is sexy and having it all doesn't mean doing it all alone. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.